got a bit of a, a wire problem with the webcam here, so I'm not quite sure if I draw something. I'm not quite sure how well it's going to be shown in the video, but at least you're getting the audio uh, up when I'm, when I'm speaking. Here, so, um, yeah, just a quick, uh, quick uh, comment on. If you can't remember how to switch the language of Norwegian to English, it really isn't a huge problem because as soon as you start in Mentor, the software is in English. But then there is no Norwegian translation for it. So, so it's in English anyway. So uh, as long as you can just find the correct, uh, correct icon on the uh, desktop, it's just double click it and then you're into everything English. So it should really be a huge problem if you can't remember how to, how to change the language of your computer. Uh, yeah. What was the sheet sizes? We looked at these. And then we're going to look at scale. Uh, this was a bit more important when, uh, when drawing by hand because you had to know the scale of what you were drawing so that if you were, if you were measuring a line in the, uh, in the uh, drawing on the paper, you had to know that, well, is this a one-to-one -one scale? So is this line going to be just as long on the manufactured uh, item? Or is it a different scale? Is it going to be twice as long or twice as short? So uh, there's, uh, it's not that important when we're doing this electronically anymore because it's so easy to change scales and stuff. But I know that there are some manufacturing places that still do control measurements by measuring the drawing and then measuring doing the scale and then measuring the, the actual product that they're creating. They control it, uh, control their own work, do policy checks in this way. Uh, when I worked for Emenko, the policy was that we're not going to put scales on anything because we don't want them to do this uh, measuring stuff. Uh, we only want them to see the number, uh, the, the dimension number, and that's what they're going to do uh, to control it uh, from. They're not going to actually measure lines uh, because uh, they had uh, they had had a couple of uh, mistakes being made where where the manufacturer measured a line and thought it was supposed to be this dimension, but it was actually set to be another dimension. So that uh, there was a lot of uh, back and forth with uh, some of the products they create. But the point with the scale is. You have the drawing size on one side, and you have the real size on the other side. So as an example, if you are drawing in a one-to-one, -one, the drawing size is, uh, one, is exactly one, and the real size is exactly one. So it means that you multiply the drawing size with one in order to get the real size. So it's the, the same. So an example is if it's a 10 millimeter line uh, on the drawing, then it will be a 10 millimeter line in real life when you have created this item. As another example, if you have a 1 to 5, a 10 millimeter line on the drawing will become a 50 millimeter line in real life. So then the drawing has been, has been uh, enlarged in order to show all the details properly. So now the drawing has been uh, scaled down in order to, to get everything to fit into the sheet. If you do it the other way around, where you have 5 to 1 instead, then the line on the drawing will be 50 millimeters, while the line, the, the same dimension in actual life, will just be 10 millimeters. So then you have uh, enlarged the drawing in order to show all of the fine details and everything. <coughs> uh, there are several sets. Uh, scales that are used. So for reduction, there are the, there's, uh, that's where you have the most scales that are set. So you have anything from 1 to 2 to 1 to 10,000. Then you can, if, you, if you're up on, uh, on this scale, you're starting to talk map sizes. And that's, uh, so if you're, you, you switch your millimeters to meters and you have 1 to 10,000, then you have a regular map, basically. So. Uh, but, but, but again, if you're going in millimeters and 1 to 10,000, you have a really large plant, like Boston or something. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, something that is being used 
you also have have uh, enlargement of the drawing so that you are scaling it up to see see the details more properly then you uh, then you only have up to 50 at the moment because it's it's uh, the enlargement part is uh, very limited as to exactly how small can you actually manufacture something and how much can you actually fit into an A3 sheet. So that's what limits the enlargement scales to, to be that fewer, not as super much as, uh, as the reduction scales. Um, yeah. So we have projections when we are creating drawings. <coughs> projections, views, and sections. We're going to look at those now. So what you get is the first angle projection method. Uh, that's what's used mostly in uh, Europe, or that's what is used in Europe, not mostly, but it's the one that is used. It means that if we have this item, which I've actually 3D printed here in the summer, so I have it here, same one. If we place it so that the F side, this side is on the sheet here, so we place it with the F side here, and if we would then want to, to project it to another side, we flip it in order to get the right side of it, we can flip it the other way, we can get the left side, and then we can continue to flip it to get the rear view of it, and the same with the bottom, we flip it up, and with the top, we flip it down in order to get it. So it's a pretty fair and simple way of doing this. I also created a, a, a short clip of it where you can, you can uh, see it here. Yeah, press this one. And in the break, you can actually do the same here if you want to. I've got the same sheets of paper here, the 3D model, if you want to look at it. And the sheets of paper that are printed, they are the same scale as the 3D printed one, so it fits perfectly on the, the sheet of paper. So just so that you can get a feel for how it's being projected. This is something that is done automatically in Inventor, the projection method, so that when you just tell it to project to that side, it's going to choose the correct way to do it. But still, it's something that's nice to uh, nice to keep in mind that this is actually this is actually something that is regulated by rules on how you are going to draw it. Americans, however, they use something called the third angle projection method. So they do it a bit the other way. So when they want to show the right side, what we do here in Europe, we flip it this way in order to show the right side. But what they do, they flip it like that instead. So it's a bit, bit more difficult to see how they are flipping it uh, on the American ones. And the difference, main difference, is basically the symbol. So in Europe, if you're using uh, the first angle projection, the, uh, the previous one, you have this symbol, you have the, the cylinder there, and you have the, the uh, conical shape there on that side. Uh, so long as you're using this and you are in Europe, uh, you don't really need to show show that symbol. But if there is a chance that your drawing is going to be used somewhere outside of Europe, it would be wise to have that symbol somewhere around your typing block in, in the drawing, just to show that this is a first angle projection method, so that whoever is reading the drawing knows how it's uh, how the layout is of the drawing. And the same if, if I'm doing uh, a job for, uh, for an American company, I would probably want to, to use this method. Now you can see the conical shape has been placed on the other side of the circle. So if I'm doing some work for an American company, they might actually require that I create all of my drawings like this. Uh, and then I would put in the symbol just so that European uh, companies that might want to use the same drawings or something that we're, maybe we're going to sell this stuff to, to a European company also later on, then they would know that the drawing is 
is in the American style, the third angle projection instead. So you have a short clip on this one too. I've created a lot of short clips in this compendium. Uh, hopefully, I've managed to keep them all silent when I've been recording them, uh, so that there shouldn't be a problem if you have forgotten to mute your computer uh, during lecture and you want to see one of the clips. Uh, the, the, hopefully, there won't be any any noise from your computer anyway, because they're uh, they should be quite silent. Uh, these clips. <coughs> um, There are also other ways of projecting. You've got the isometric projection method, and uh, it is often used. We often use the layout, the first angle projection, to sort of show uh, everything that has to do with with the manufacturing part of the uh, of the item. But then, what is often done is that we take an isometric view, which is basically you're seeing it sort of at an angle. Uh, the, the finished product is at an angle, and you place that. You can uh, you can reduce it a lot. Uh, you can make it uh, a lot smaller than the drawing, the and then you just place it down in a corner or something. And maybe you even shade it so that it's uh, more more easily uh, seen. Uh, shading it can be a bit of a problem. In in Imenko, we had a policy that we didn't shade them. Like this one is shaded in blue. We didn't shade them because what we noticed was that if you used a copy machine, you copy the drawing, then the shading would look really terrible. So, so we decided to not shade them uh, in Imenko. Imenko had decided it long before I started working there. But I think that's not a problem anymore because copy machines are so good now. Uh, that was more a problem uh, 10, 15 years ago when copy machines weren't really all that good. Uh, didn't deliver that uh, good of quality. The uh, theory behind the isometric projection method is a 30 degree angle. So they tilt everything at a 30 degree angle, which means that if you are doing rounded shapes, uh, a, a circular hole, it will be shown as an ellipse instead. And then you have a whole host of uh, angles and stuff you have to look at when you're going to draw this. But this is only, this is only when you do it by hand. If you do this in Mento, you put in an isometric view, it's just going to put it in there. You don't have to you don't have to think about all these angles, you just say isometric, place it there, you're done. But this is uh, the theory behind it, what, what Inventor actually does when it does this. <coughs> so we also have um, the possibility of doing partial views. Let's move this one over here. It's easier for me to follow my notes. The partial views are usually broken up. Uh, so you're just showing a small section of, the, of this part and you're flipping it just to, to show that it's... In fact, if you look, it from, uh, look at it from this side, it uh, might be might be a, a solid part with just a hole in it at the end, but if you flip it, you see that there's actually a slot in there. <coughs> and you can also do it uh, when, when we are talking about symmetry, like here. And this one will be symmetric along this line, which means that this, this part uh, will also be on this side, and then you will have the circle over there. This cutout will also be present on this side, and the holes will be uh, have the same locations on the other side, same same dimensions between uh, between this line and everything else. This one is a, a, a double symmetry, if you want to call it that. So it's both symmetrical on this side and on this side. So you can flip it flip it into four parts. So that is just a, a, quad, a single uh, quadrant of the of the parts, because everything else is exactly the same. So any dimensions you put on this part will be the same on the other sides as well. <clears throat> it's also possible to do a very simplified view. Like here you have a slot that's been cut into an axle. This one is, is uh, cylindrical, because we have a center line here that shows that it's, this is the axis of the cylinder. And then they've just shown up here that the, this slot 
is supposed to have a certain width. So here you would have put in the, the uh, width the dimension of the slot. <coughs> it is also possible if you have ax uh, shafts and axles that you're going to use, uh, they can be very long. Uh, especially if you're working on a, on a ship or something, you might have an, a shaft that's uh, 10 meters long almost. Uh, then it might be uh, very useful on the drawing to be able to sort of cut down the size, basically. So as long as it keeps the same, uh, so long as it doesn't change its diameter here, it's uh, 75 millimeters in diameter all along here, you can cut it, and this 75 millimeter diameter part, that can actually be 5 meters now, if you want to. But you have just You've made a cut here to show, and a cut on the other side just to show that this one continues. And then you would put in a length here to, to, to show exactly how long it is. If it's five meters, it will say 5,000 5, millimeters uh, on the dimension. So you would quickly understand that this one has been broken up. And there are two ways of showing it, either by uh, sort of hand-drawn lines or by these uh, squiggly lines. Uh, inventor uses the squiggly lines automatically when you do this. And, and if inventor fixes the dimension and everything, so all of this is uh, mostly automated when you do it. The thing is that <coughs> when we uh, create drawings in inventor, much of it is automated, but not everything. So that we, we sort of have to learn where do we have to give extra input to inventor in order to get this correctly according to how it's supposed to look. <coughs> uh, you also have sections where you can create them. Here it's shown with a section line. Uh, it's usually, usually on sections you use letters. So you use uh, A to A to show that this is the section line A. And then you identify the section with uh, A dash A. And what you actually do then is you, you create an imaginary cut straight through the entire, entire part. So you just cut it away and then you remove this part and then you look into the rest of the part from uh, the same direction as the arrows are coming from. So basically we've, we've cut away this, we've removed it and now we are looking at this part and then it will look like this. Just to show that in the, there's a pipe part here, it's open in the middle here. You have uh, bolt holes on these parts and the rest is uh, solid. Material. So, please, could you go over that again? I don't quite see. It. Yeah, um, it's a bit difficult to, to to visualize the first time you are doing this because because it's uh, it requires quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of experience. I don't know, experience, but uh, you you have to see it a couple of times before you realize what's happening. So basically, I'm trying to use this one to show it. Uh, what's being done is you imagine that you're cutting it in half and then you're removing the part that is on this side, this half, you're removing it completely and then you're looking in at this side. So you're just flipping it so that you are, can, can show it on the, on the drawing. So then you see everything that you have cut there. And in this case, when it's been cut, this is a, this is a 90 degree bend for, for a pipe which means that it's hollow on the inside, so that's why it's white in the middle there, because it shows that it's hollow in, in there. And then the parts that have been cross-hatched there with the 45 degree angle lines, those are material that has been cut. So that's where, that's where, your, uh, where your saw blade has actually cut through the material. So, uh, ways that you can also use this is to, uh, instead of having to create one section through the slot here and then one section through the hole, you can actually do these 90 degree angles on the section. So that the first section here goes halfway through the slot, and that's what you see here on the top here, that's the slot, it's showing it, and then it moves over to the hole and then it continues down. So then you get a hole on the on the on the other, other side of the the midline, which means that this slot will be it will be uh, symmetrical uh, along this line. So length you have here that will be the same length down there, 
And for the hole that is, of course, cylindrical, so that will also be the same. The same dimension you have there will be up there. So you can show you can show more than one thing during one section. So, but we'll, we will uh, we will be uh, moving into that more when we do the practice tasks that you're going to do. We, uh, I will be showing this stuff to you more. And the reason that we are going through this now is that it is nice to just have seen everything before we start actually doing it, or else we're, we're, we're sitting around and doing stuff and you don't know why you're doing it. So this is just sort of uh, so that you know that when we start doing this stuff in the practice tasks, we can remember, ah, oh, there was something about that in the first part of the campaign. And then, then you can uh, pull it up and you can read a little bit about it and just see what it was and uh, what we do. Or you can do the, uh, the Metal Trades Handbook. You can open the technical drawing. Because this is just a, a, a direct copy from, from that page. There, so, yeah. Is it possible to, on Invento, yeah. is it possible to follow the steps? Like, I submitted my assignment to you. Is it possible for you to go back through the steps I used to make an assembly? Uh, sort of. I can sort of do it. If you have done... Uh, if you have done something uh, that you uh, like, if you, if you create something and then you figure out that ah, oh, I done something, I've done something I shouldn't have done here, so then you either use the the undo button to to move uh, the steps backwards, or that you just delete stuff and start afresh. I, I won't be able to see that uh, from your three uh, uh, D file, uh, but what I will see is your finished product. So I will see all of the steps that you have done for your finished product. So, so that's the uh, that's the important part. Uh, uh, for, for the individual submissions, the, the 3D model, uh, what I'm actually doing there is I'm just checking how you have done stuff, if it's a reasonable way that you've done it, or maybe you have done it in a very complicated way, which could have been done much easier. Then I can show you, uh, create a few comments, just show that uh, this, you, you could have done this in a fairly easier way. It would be easier to, to edit your uh, 3D model later on and stuff. So the less complex you manage to make your 3D models, the easier it will be to fix things if you have to go back and fix stuff later. So that's the only reason why uh, why the 3D models have to have to be delivered together with the with the uh, 2D drawings uh, for the individual submissions. It's just so that I can make comments to you so that you can try to improve for the next. Uh, as I was talking about the, the 45 degree angle stuff, that shows material that has been cut in order to show something inside the material. Like here, uh, it's showing something that has been cut in order to show the hole that is drilled and how it looks. Uh, because that way you can, you can uh, put dimensions onto the hole so that whoever is going to produce this knows that uh, I'm going to drill this 20 millimeters deep and then uh, 10 millimeters from the edge here, I'm going to drill another hole in there. So, so then they will know what they are supposed to do. <coughs> uh, the thing is that when you're starting to cut several, uh, if, if you have several parts that have been put together and then you create a section, then it's a bit difficult to see uh, where the materials are being cut. So that, that's what's happened here. Here you have a shaft and you have a pin that is uh, locking it into place, and then you have the material around it. And as you can see here, they've used 45 degree angles here. They've also used that on the pin, but they have less space between the lines. And up top on the main material, they have uh, switched it the other way around. So that they, uh, that way you can see that this is one material, this is one material, and this is one material. So it's uh, easier to, uh, to distinguish what is what. And the same so, uh, on this one, it, it's tilted, an ellipsis that is tilted, and it's tilted at a 45 degree angle. So both this center line and this center line show, uh, would, would uh, end up inside the 45 degree, uh, no matter what, which way you did it. So instead, this one has been done at a 90 degree angle, just so that you won't get any collision between the other lines. So it's, uh, it's all about trying to make the, uh, the drawing as easy as possible to, uh, to uh, read afterwards for those who are going to create this product. Uh, the next one is uh, 
different ways of sectioning it. One way that is uh, sometimes used, and it depends a bit from company to company how much they use this, is one way you just show uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, well, at least you're showing this kind of line. It's uh, completely escaped what they're called right now. Uh, where it's uh, it's cut up, the line is cut into uh, different sections, all of the same length. Uh, these are called hidden lines, so they show something that has been cut inside the uh, inside the item without actually sectioning it, as it's done there. But the thing is, if you do this on a fairly complex part, and you use these hidden lines to show everything that is inside, instead of using sections, you suddenly have a whole lot of dimensions going on, on one view, instead of having the external dimensions on this view and then having the internal dimensions on that view. So it can, it can quickly become very confusing uh, for the drawing if you're using these, these hidden lines. Sometimes they are necessary simply because you don't have room on your sheet to put in a section view of what you want to show. So then you have to show it with hidden lines. And maybe it's only two or three dimensions that's going to be shown anyway. So then you can sort of allow yourself to do this. But like when I worked for Emenko, it was uh, it was a complete no-no to use use uh, these hidden lines. They uh, they would actually let me rather uh, create a second sheet in order to manage to show everything. So that then uh, they felt that was better than to use these hidden lines to show. But that that's one way of doing it. You have the full section as we've already seen, where it's cut directly through. It is also possible to do a half section. Uh, so that's sort of a, a mix of two. You have the upper part of the outside. So here it's the outside you are watching, and then you have the lower part, which is cut. So basically what you've done is, if this was a cylinder, which is it, it is a cylinder. done here is that they have cut a section in here. So for, for this part of the section, what we are looking at this page, uh, this uh, from this side, we see the outside of the cylinder. So that's what we see up here. See the outside of the cylinder. But when you look here, you have actually cut away one quadrant, one quadrangle of the of the uh, cylinder to show how it looks like on the inside. And another uh, possibility is to use these partial sections where you just uh, cut away parts of the cylinder just to show that something is going on on the inside here. <coughs> uh, special. Oh, that one. Uh, some parts are not to be sectioned, uh, so that if you have assembled uh, stuff and in your assembly you have bolts uh, going through it, if you are sectioning through the bolt here, so that you're showing a cut through the material and showing where the bolt is, the bolt is not to be shown as cut. The bolt is to be shown as it's uh, as if it's uh, complete. Uh, and the same goes for, for pins that you're putting in, and also for for ribs that's in. That one's a bit difficult to show, so I'm going to show you a better, better image. These are ribs that have been created. Uh, whether they are, uh, these two offer strength, basically, just to add extra strength. to so, so to avoid having too thick walls in order to get the correct strength, they have added ribs inside so that you can uh, still have the same strength. And if you're doing a section there, you would show the walls as being cut, but the ribs will be shown as not cut. So if you were doing a, a section through this part, so the wall would be cut, but the ribs would not be cut. So an, another example is for cooling. Uh, these are electrical engines, so they have ribs for cooling on the outsides. So those ribs would also not be cut in section two. 
Then you have uh, more specialized types of sections. So here's a profile, uh, a steel profile. So if you cut it, it looks like this. So that's uh, typical is something you use when you're building a wall or something. You can use it. Uh, it has because it, ha it has been bent like this. It has quite a lot of strength, so it can be very long before it starts to to bend. Uh, and then you have length here. So if you, the, the regular way of showing this is to make a cut through it and show it on the side there. But you can also overlay it on top there if you need to. If you need to uh, save space on your sheet, it is possible to overlay it like that. <coughs> Another way of showing things is, is instead of having the, the 90 degree angle that I've shown earlier on sections, you can actually use other angles. So here there is a I'm quite sure 120 degree angle or something on it, uh, just to show uh, show all of the parts here uh, in this one when it's cut. Uh, the same on this one. You can see the ribs are on the sides here, and there's a rib. So these these holes aren't actually being cut in the section, but they can be shown as cut in the section. It's allowed to sort of just move them up to the correct position for a cut. So that one is a bit, uh, a bit, uh, a bit difficult to visualize. <coughs> uh, and this is typically stuff that Inventor won't be able to handle automatically. Uh, it's stuff that you actually have to, you have to go in there and manually manipulate the views in order for them to look as you want them to look. Uh, but that's a lot easier actually to do when you're drawing by hand. When you're drawing in a venter, it would be, in this case, for, for this one, for example, it would be easier to just do a section across the hole and then do another section across the ribs. So you can just show it in two sections instead. So you will learn as you are working in, in the software, you will learn what's, uh, what's a, a smart way of doing stuff instead of doing it really complicated. Here's uh, another way of showing uh, several sections from one piece because there, there's a lot going on in this one. There you have a hidden hidden slot on the other side of the cylinder, so that one is shown there. And here you have a slot on both sides, so it's one there and one there. And here you have a slot on the underside of the cylinder, which is shown there. So that there's uh, a lot of ways to use these sections to, to show details of stuff. <coughs> You also have moving parts. Uh, did I skip one? Yeah, I skipped one here. Uh, you have the possibility of using using detailed views also, where you just uh, it's silly that I didn't have that one. But you can see it there on page twenty one. Uh, the the figure that's uh, on the bottom part of the page. But they basically done a done a little bubble over uh, uh, over a detail, which is there, and then they create a new view of the detail where they enlarge it so that they can show these small lines what's actually happening here. <coughs> so that's a, a way of showing very small details. You can do these detailed views where you can enlarge it a lot uh, in order to get to show what's happening with dimensions and such. <coughs> so movable parts, if you're doing an assembly and you have movable parts in it, it's possible to show it uh, like this. So this arm here can be rotated 90 degrees up here. So then it will show it in the alternate position, end position. And this, this uh, arc here will show where it actually moves. So you, you, uh, if you have one end position that's a solid line and one end position that's a dotted line, and then you have an arc that shows where it's moving. The same can be done for something that's not moving in an arc, but uh, that is moving uh, in, a, in a straight line or something. You can do, do the same stuff there. Uh, it's not something that I've seen that much of in my work, uh, but I know that in the car industry, if you're going to design something there, it's very often used uh, different positions for stuff. Such as uh, the suspension uh, gear on on the car, it will often be shown with 
with the uh, springs fully compressed and with the springs fully uh, extended, just to show what uh, how much movement there will be in the suspension. Sometimes you have adjacent parts that aren't really part of your drawing. So maybe uh, here you are actually bolting it to a housing, but the housing isn't a part of your drawing really. But then you can actually add these dotted lines to show that there's a housing in there where it's supposed to be, be, uh, be fastened onto. <coughs> There's a whole lot of different kinds of lines that are being used in technical drawings. First off, we're going to look at line thicknesses. As I was uh, mentioning with the uh, different types of lead you can use on your, your uh, push pencils. 0 0.5 and 0 0.7, they are uh, often used. Uh, and it comes from here, but just being able to actually draw it by hand uh, with different uh, line uh, thicknesses. So in, in a technical drawing you're supposed to have uh, thick lines and thin lines and uh, you're only to have one, th one type of thin lines and one type of thick lines. So if you're going for a 0.7 millimeter thick line you have to have the 0.35 millimeter uh, thin line. Uh, and the ratio is one to two, so, so the thin line is uh, half the thickness of the, of the thick line. And uh, the difference between uh, the groups of lines here, so you have 0 0.5 to 0 0.7, that's actually found by doing one to the square root of two. So that's how they raise the, each group there. It's really not a problem when we are doing uh, stuff in Inventor because Inventor does this automatically, thankfully. <laughs> I remember when I was doing my vocational studies, that was a pain to always choose the correct uh, length when you were growing. There are some uh, examples of lines. We have, uh, have the uh, solid lines, which is also the same type as you use. Uh, you use the same line thickness for freehand uh, lines and for uh, break lines. And uh, you have them, they are being used as dimension lines, and as extension lines, and uh, the hatching the, uh, that shows material that has been cut. Uh, you also have it as the root of threads, uh, border lines when you are doing cutouts, uh, imaginary intersections, uh, it says there. Uh, yeah, that's just to show where it's. Uh, Yeah, that's uh, to show the imaginary intersection. It means that it's uh, moving outwards or in uh, there. It's, uh, there's an angle. You can't really see it because you're looking straight at it, but there is an angle there. So there's a change of, uh, of plane uh, for it. <coughs> so you can see all of them have been, they've been uh, given numbers. So you can find them uh, here. Uh, then you also have the thick lines is mainly the outlines of the drawings that is used to show the outline of the parts. The dashed thin lines, <coughs> uh, they were yeah, dashed thin lines are really not that often used. They are used to show that you are going to do something to this entire surface. So in this case, it's a designation of heat treatment uh, is used, but you can also use it for uh, if you are going to, to have a specific kind of surface finish, uh, if it's going to be a polished surface or uh, something like that. So you can use that to show that the entire entire tip pair is going to be, be uh, treated in some sort of way. Uh, yeah, and you also have the uh, the thin lines. Uh, yeah, they are 
being used for the same. The dot dash line is a pretty funny name, but they are uh, they are mainly mainly very descriptive. It's a dot dash line because it has a long dash and then it has a dot and then another long dash and then another dot. So it's so it's very descriptive. These names for lines. And uh, the dot dash line is usually used for for uh, center lines and lines of symmetries and stuff. So going through this hole here, you have a center line to show that it's a, it's a cylindrical hole. Uh, so then you use a uh, dot dash line. Uh, same with the symmetry here to show that if you if you put a dimension from this side to this side, it will be symmetrical. Uh, around the center there. So it will be uh, equal on each side. So you cut stuff in the middle of it. And then we have the the thick one version of the same, uh, which is basically just uh, not really much used. Uh, inventor, inventor usually takes care of that one. Then you have the two dot dash dot line. So it's a pretty fun name. The, the only difference is that you have two dots instead of one. So. And that's what you use if you have adjacent parts. I uh, don't think there were any adjacent parts in this one. But like in the... In this one, where you have an adjacent part, the housing that it's uh, attached to, you use the, the two dot dash dot line. Mostly, as I've already mentioned, mostly a method does this automatically. But there, there are a few kinds of lines that we need to pay special attention to. So after the break, we are going to start looking at those. Of half there also, so, so 
you save a bit of time and the drawing becomes a lot easier to read for those who are going to create it because they know that it's symmetrical so it's going to be the same on both sides so that's a, a huge plus with using those uh, center lines, it's the same function, uh, symmetry lines. Uh, the, the lines are also shown as the same when we're using them. But the center line is used to show something that is uh, cylindrical. Either in this case where we have uh, a section, we have a section in material and we have a cylindrical hole that's going through the material. So then the, the center line is showing uh, the axis through the cylinder. But you can also place the center line uh, outside uh, a cylindrical item that isn't being sectioned just to show where the where the axis of the cylinder lies so if you, if you have done this and it's a cylinder you've uh, put in a a dimension here which is maybe it's 80 millimeters in diameter as soon as you have a diameter and you have a center line it is implicit that this entire section is cylindrical. So that, then you automatically know that it's cylindrical. You don't. Uh, uh, if this is everything that you've done, like the, the teams that have cylinders in, in, uh, that they're going to lift, all they need to do is actually show this. They can show the length, length of the cylinder, so it's uh, 160 length. 80 in uh, diameter, and you don't really need to show it from this side to show that it's circular because you have a center line and you have a diameter. So then it has to have the same diameter across the entire length. <coughs> uh, so that's the uh, whole point with the, the center lines. And so Please, I'll just take you back to one. Yeah. One the symmetry? Yeah, yeah the symmetry. Yeah. Where you have this length of. Uh, Dimension of one entity. It's uh, just to show how wide the entire. Is that the entire? Yeah, that's the entire bed from, from this side to this side. Not just the symmetrical part. No, not just, not just the symmetrical part, but uh, in the symmetry, it is so, uh, so long as you have given this dimension all the way over here, it means that half of it goes down to the the symmetry line, okay. and then you go the rest of the half, uh, the, the second half is. Not to the other side. Okay, so, 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 so the, the, the symmetry line will be centered on those 180 in the middle of them. So, and the same on that side with the, with the 60. It will be at, uh, it will be 30 millimeters up there and 30 millimeters down there. So. Uh, it is also used like on this hole here. If we are seeing it from the top, so that it is just a circle, we use these center marks just to show that this is a hole that is going into into the, uh, the part because uh, uh, on, a, on a white sheet of paper you can't really show that this is something that goes through the entire part or just uh, some depth into it or something uh, so that's why you use use the center mark to show that there is a cylindrical thing that is going into the parts you will need a, a, a cross section or uh, or some text to show how deep it is, if it's going all the way through or if it's just uh, a certain depth. But still, you have uh, you use the center mark to show that here it is. Uh, the center. Then we have uh, dimensions. There's another one that I've uh, missed putting in here. Let's see. <coughs> Uh, you also have the pitch circle diameter, which is the next uh, one uh, below the center one, which is uh, a combination of center marks and and uh, a center line. So what you actually do is you have, in this case, there is a it's a flange for uh, for a valve or something, and you have holes that are distributed across it. So they're bolt holes, you're going to bolt something onto this flange. And e each of the holes are supposed to have their own center mark. Just to show their centers. But then you can actually use the, the center mark function 
a center line function, and you can choose this hole, and then it will start a line from it. The uh, first off, when you do it, when you do it from this hole to that hole, it will first off create a, a direct line between them. But then as soon as you choose another hole for it, then it will convert the line into an arc. So that will start and then if you choose that hole as the next hole, it will continue to that one, and then you choose the, the first hole again. So it will go up there. And what this one shows is, is what's uh, called a pitch circle diameter. And basically it is just to show that from the center of the flange is the same same radius to all of the holes. They are all placed in a circle. Uh, to show. Like if you're, if you're uh, changing the wheels on your car, the rim will have actually have a pitch circle diameter in order to, to get all the holes in the correct position when you're going to, uh, to put the bolts through or, or the nuts up. <coughs> and that is usually then uh, given instead of a, it is still a circle, so it has a diameter, but instead of giving it the, the usual, the phi uh, symbol, in uh, all Norwegians uh, screw this up because we have after X, Y, Z in our alphabet, we also have these letters. So we Norwegians constantly use that letter, but that, that's not actually the same one because this one is uh, it's a bit sh the line is a bit shorter and at a different angle because this is actually the Greek letter fire. A capital five. <clears throat> uh, so you use this one usually for for diameter. So just to show, it's a diameter of eighty. But for this one, a pitch circle diameter, you will create. Instead, you will do P C D eighty. So it's a pitch circle diameter. <clears throat> Uh, and that's just to show that it's uh, it's uh, it's the circle on which all of these bolts are placed. Basically, I'll be showing this when we get to it in, in the practice tests also. So I'll be, be uh, repeating that. So the dimensioning. <laughs> The important thing when we are uh, are dimensioning our drawings is that we need we need the important or the, the functional dimensions, the ones that are important for this part to function as it's supposed to function. Yeah. Was that was there a question? Uh, yeah. yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Concerning the views. Yeah. What is the difference between a orthographic and asymmetric? Uh, the orthographic uh, is, uh, if I can remember this one uh, correctly, the uh, orthographic view is basically, let's see here. Uh, the isometric view is the one with the, the 30 degrees angles. So that's 30 degrees there, 30 degrees there, and then you have the, uh, the parts. It, it's tilted so that it uh, has a 30 degree angle on all of them. The orthographic one is a bit different uh, because uh, if you're a painter and you're supposed to paint something, you will do it in perspective. So that something that is supposed to be further away from you, from you it will also be smaller. So that you sort of you envision a uh, point on the horizon and then you sort of pull your your lines from there. So that if I'm going to make a cube here, I would make the cube like this. Then it's in perspective, because it's all moving towards that point in the horizon. But the orthographic one will uh, just use the exact length of the sides. So it's, it's, a, it's a perfect 3D representation. It doesn't uh, take into account the the uh, point on the horizon. So e even though this side of the 
cube is supposed to be further away from me, it is still the exact same length as this side. It's not shorter as it is in a perspective view. So, so the orthographic view is what we usually use when we are uh, creating the 3D models. So when we are uh, twisting it and turning it and creating new stuff, it's all orthographic. So that if you want to create a an illustration that's going to be used on the web page of your company or something, then it's often uh, better to go into the, your viewing uh, options and put it to perspective instead, because it will look... Uh, to, to engineers, engineers are very used to seeing it orthographic, so we, we don't really... We understand that it's orthographic automatically when we see it, when, when you're used to seeing it. But uh, regular uh, customers that sees uh, an illustration on a web page, they would go, there's something, there's something off about that picture. It doesn't look right. So if you uh, instead put it in perspective mode, then uh, Inventor will automatically uh, fix it to a perspective so that you can create an, uh, an illustration of the, the parts. So, but basically, in the 3D drawings, it's isometric, and it's the the first angle projection uh, that you use for them. Now, I'm not quite sure what kind of projection method is most used in Nigeria, if it's the American one, the third angle, or if it's the European type, which is the first angle. So I'm really not sure what you're going to have to expect when you start working, but uh, that's why I'm mentioning both of them, because those are the two that are the most in use, so, so it's most likely that you will hit on one of those, at least. So, <clears throat> the important dimensions to, uh, to have on uh, the groin is the ones that have a direct effect on the function uh, of the part. So, if, uh, if one of the functions of the part is that it's uh, a shaft that has to be a certain length, uh, in order to, to fit between the bearings of the shaft where it's going to rotate, then of course that length has to be in there so that you know how long it's supposed to be. So that that's, uh, has a direct effect on the function of the parts. And these dimension, they, dimensions, they have to be clear and visible. You can sort of like have uh, hide them inside other dimensions or something. You have to, they have to be the dimensions that are the first thing you see when you start looking at the drawing, you will see these important dimensions first off. And uh, it must not be necessary to calculate them. So you have to actually give the full dimension so that if, if we have something that is uh, something like this, uh, we, we can't just start dimensioning uh, like this, maybe. So that you have a gap there, and then you, maybe you have a dimension there or something. So you would have to give all of the dimensions and give them properly, so that the guys, uh, or I always say guys, guys are women. There, there are a lot of women working in uh, mechanical uh, uh, shops also, uh, at least here in Norway. So whoever it is that's manufacturing it won't have to pull out their calculator and start calculating to, to get the dimensions that are important. They have to be clear uh, on the drawing. Because as soon as you introduce an element of someone pulling out the calculator, it's uh, a pretty fair chance that they're going to push the wrong button or something and get the wrong calculation when they're doing this. And then you will have to do the entire part again if, if they do something critically wrong. And worst off, if the quality controls aren't good enough, it won't be noticed, and then maybe you send it offshore, and then they notice it when they've already lowered it down to 3,000 meters below the surface, used uh, half an hour, an hour to lower it down, and then it won't fit together. So it's, it can be really, uh, really drastic. So that won't really happen, that something will go that far before it's discovered, because there, there are so many steps of uh, of the quality control. But still, e even though it, it is discovered in the first quality control, it, it still means that this exact part has to be manufactured uh, all over again. And if it has to be manufactured all over again, it might be that the, the workshop doesn't have, uh, have a, an available software right now. So they might have to wait a week uh, until they are finished with what they are actually doing right now, until they can do this one again. 
And then you're suddenly starting to get uh, quite a bit of delay in your project. And if you uh, have a really tight deadline, you, you don't have time for delays like that. Because uh, often you have to pay, uh, pay fines. Uh, at least that's uh, pretty, pretty normal here in Norway, that we have to pay fines for every day of over the deadline that we go through. So the, the supplier actually has to pay. Instead of receiving money from the customer, they have to pay the customer because they uh, haven't delivered on time. So that's a uh, that's a good incentive to <laughs> to actually be on time. Uh, less important dimensions. They have no direct effect on on the function of the, of the parts, uh, but they are necessary when you are fabricating it. So, like for the uh, the. Uh, the shaft that has to be a certain length between uh, the two bearings that it's being uh, put up on. It's not all that important that the shaft goes uh, 20 millimeters outside of the bearing on, on each side. That's not a really important uh, dimension for it, so long as the entire shaft is inside the bearing and stretches out to the other side. But that would be a less important dimension. So it still has to be there because whoever it is that is uh, turning this uh, shaft in the workshop, he has to know well how, how long is it going to be overall. So it, it has to know, uh, know that dimension. But it is not critical for, for the function of it. Auxiliary dimensions, they are for information only. They have, often they don't have any significance for the production part. Of the, uh, of the thing, but they might have have some uh, significance for the assembly. So it, it might be uh, good for the mechanic to know this dimension when he is going to put the parts together, while for whoever it is that is uh, creating the parts physically, uh, doesn't really need to know this dimension. <coughs> uh, which means that dimensions like that, you, you don't give them any tolerances. They are just given as, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's 80, 80 millimeters, it just says 80 millimeters. It won't have any, any plus minus 0 0.1 millimeter or something. That's a, a tolerance. It's just to tell the guys that are producing it that you are allowed to create this one from 79.9 to 80.1 millimeters. It's allowed to be within those. Usually, they are pretty spot on and hit pretty spot on, but uh, if something is uh, a little bit off or something, they might end up at 80.1. If they end up at 80.11, that's not good enough, and they have to have to uh, uh, remove some uh, from it, because then they haven't hit the correct target area. But that's not what you do for auxiliary dimensions. You don't give them uh, any tolerances for those. And you also put them inside a parenthesis, because then the guy that is, uh, guy or girl that is uh, creating this part, he knows that uh, I don't really need to know anything about this. It's inside a parenthesis. I don't really need to know it. So you put it. You just add add this on, so that you sort of make it very clear that this isn't an important dimension. <coughs> and the the whole part with the dimension lines is pretty extensive. Uh, Inventor does most of this itself. Uh, there are rules as to the thickness of the lines, the placement of the numbers, uh, even the shape of the arrows. There are pretty strict rules as to how they are to look. But uh, as I said, Inventor really takes care of this. So it's not. It's nice to know that there are actually rules that govern this. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, so it's. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, here are some examples of them. <coughs> One thing you can see here in the example is that the extension line that goes from the center and up to the 15 uh, millimeter uh, dimension, it, it's, uh, there, there is no line going straight through, through the diameter of the hole. So it's just been cut away in this part. Uh, and that is to improve the readability of the diameter of the hole. Uh, that is something that Inventor doesn't always do. It doesn't always pick up stuff like that, that it has an overlap of uh, dimensions. 
So then it's up to us that well, how can we how can we show this in another way? So one possibility here would be to give this diameter dimension below instead, because then we wouldn't have uh, crossing dimensions there. <coughs> Um, because uh, you are not supposed to have a line going straight through another dimension like that. Um, yeah, you can place them inside your parts if you want to, uh, but the general rule is that you place uh, place the dimension on the outside, and at least what's uh, usual for for uh, for Norway and uh, most of Europe is that you try to place your dimensions below and on the right side of it. So as far as you can, you try to place your, your dimensions there. If, if you're completely filled up with dimensions on this side, uh, you have to put some on, on, the, on the left side. But the point is that if we put them below, we are, uh, the text will always be read from below. So it's, uh, they will always be placed this way. And if you are looking at it from the right, you will also have the text uh, rotated this way, so that's why you try to uh, try to keep to these sides when you are placing it. <coughs> uh, there, there are several ways of uh, of putting dimensions into crowded spaces where you where you uh, really don't have all that room. Like for the eight millimeter here, the the arrows have been placed on the outside instead of on the inside, just to make room for the uh, number 8. Uh, for the 16, and the arrows are on the inside, as they usually are. For the 7 and the 5, there is actually not room for arrows for them, so what's been done instead is just place a dot there, just to show that a new dimension is starting here. So that's a possibility too. Uh, what can be done in order to show without a doubt that both of these slots are uh, equally deep, you can uh, make the extension line go from the furthest one and out so that it cuts straight through the bottom of the other slots, just to show. But uh, usually the drawings are clear enough that if you have dimensioned it from this point and out, uh, it's pretty clear that these are on line, that they, are, they are on, uh, have the same height. <coughs> Uh, as I was talking about up here with uh, little room for it, here you have even less room, so you can actually use uh, leader arrows pointing into where the dimension is. Uh, if, if I did this design, I would rather put in a detailed view there. So I would create a circle, and then I would uh, enlarge that circle uh, somewhere else, so just so that we can put the dimensions more clearly in there. <coughs> Another thing you will see here is that uh, they uh, on this one they've given the total length, and then they've started off on this side, and they are giving the lengths, and then they get to the last one, and they put then that one as an auxiliary dimension. So the only reason that the ten is there is that it's going to be very easy for whoever is producing it to pull out their uh, their. Uh, the measurement device. It's got a name, but I can't remember it in English right now. Uh, and they can just measure that they are about 10 millimeters on that one. But what is important here is that uh, we start off at this side and we move along here. These dimensions have to be exact and within their tolerances. But when you get to the number 10, that's not that important. It's the overall length of 40 that's important. So they, if, if these are uh, a bit shorter than the actual lengths that are there, but they are still within the, within the tolerance of what they are supposed to be, the overall, overall length of that will be uh, more than 10. But as long as the others are within their tolerances, that's completely fine. Not a problem. Uh, we've already looked at symmetry lines and uh, putting the dimensions uh, on both sides of the symmetry line, and then automatically saying that it's the equal length on both sides of, uh, of the symmetry line. What they've also done here is to show uh, a very uh, a very good method of uh, showing lengths. They are using this line as the baseline, so all of the dimensions are going from that line. 
this means that uh, let us say that you have plus minus 0 0.1 uh, in uh, tolerance for each one of these. This means that if you had dimensioned them like they have been here, all in a row, then you would have, here you will have uh, plus minus 0 0.1 on the 2, so it can be 2.1, 15.1, plus 2.1. So then you are suddenly at 17.2, not 17.1. Here, each of them gets their own uh, plus minus 0 0.1 tolerance. So that you, you, here you sort of stack the tolerances on top of each other. So that if you go to one extreme, uh, either uh, too far or too short uh, on all of the dimensions, you will end up with uh, eating a lot of uh, this one way. But on the, these, everyone has their set limit of plus minus 0 0.1. Because everyone is go everyone is me being measured from the same starting point instead of going one directly after the other. <coughs> yeah, uh, I think that was basically the same. As the yeah, well, more or less try to keep it uh, on these sides if you can. Like here, it would have been, it would have been really uh, sort of messy if we were to put the sixteen over there and the six down there. The six would crash with the other six, so that's fair to put it up top. And the sixteen would sort of go through the entire part before it came out on the other side. So it's it's uh, sort of silly to pull it all the way through there. It's better to just put it. On the edge that is closest. <coughs> yeah, and here we have again an, an example of uh, of putting uh, parentheses on the last one because it's the total total length that is the that is the driving dimension there. Here you can also see that they have put in a t equals five, which means that the thickness the thickness of this part here. Is supposed to be five, so, so the entire part is five thick, which means that they have only drawn it. They have only drawn it like uh, like that. They haven't done a. Uh, they haven't done a projected view of it. So that if they make a rough sketch here, uh, if they had done a projected view, they would have flipped it over and shown it like this. And then we have shown that the thickness was five uh, for it. But instead of instead of doing that projected view just to show the thickness, they have just written it in that it's the thickness is five. So it's a five millimeter thick plate, and uh, you are to cut this this design out of it. <coughs> yeah, the the best way of placing the dimensions is to simply choose these starting lines. Uh, and let all of the dimensions go for them. But as you can see, you will quickly start to, to build up a lot of, uh, use a lot of space on a sheet. So it's not always possible to use this method, although it is the, the safest one with regards to avoiding problems with tolerances in production. Uh, sometimes it, you just don't have any room for it. And if it's not really that important, uh, like it's not, uh, important for the function of the part, just for the production, then it doesn't really matter if you, if you uh, stack them uh, in order to save some space. You can do the same for, uh, for uh, uh, angles. So you, you use the same baseline for the angles here in order to show that, because the angles will also have tolerances. Uh, and actually tolerances for angles, they, uh, the, they, they have to have larger tolerances than regular lengths. It's much easier to say that something is uh, is uh, uh, 325 millimeters plus minus 0 0.1 millimeter than saying that you have 30 degrees plus minus uh, 0 0.1 degree. That's uh, a lot more difficult to to actually uh, measure that you you are within uh, within the uh, tolerance. Then. So that's often why there are larger tolerances. Yeah. Uh, what actually determines the tolerance? Is it the time? 
kind of design? Or? Uh, actually, when you're designing, it is you that determine the tolerances. Uh, but the tolerances uh, will be uh, determined by the function, really. Because you have to sit there and you have to think of, well, what happens if if this one becomes 325.2? Will, will everything still work? Will everything fit together? No, it won't. So it can only be 325.1. So, so you sort of have to uh, you have to look at all of the all of the dimensions and see just how much can I allow myself to deviate from from the given dimension here uh, before things start to go uh, become problematic with getting bolts into their holes and uh, the movements of parts and everything. So what if what if you are designing a part that has to fit into other parts that have already been designed? Yeah. Is it still possible to create tolerance? Yeah, yeah, you still use tolerances. Well, one thing that is actually really important there is that if you are if you're designing a, a cylindrical item that is going into hole, it is really important that your your diameter, let us say we, we use 80 again, it is really important that you go from 0 to minus 0 0.1, for example. But you won't allow it to become more than 80. It can't become 80.1. Because if it becomes more than that, it will not fit into the hole. Because the hole you are putting it in, yeah, putting it in that's it. this is a bit of an exaggeration. You won't have this much space, most likely. But the hole that you are putting it in is also supposed to be 80. But you might put that one as plus one to plus two, which means that the basis of the hole is going to be 80, but the actual hole that they are drilling has to be between 80.1 or 80.2. I didn't do zero sometimes. Zero, so zero. And 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, th those are huge tolerances in, in, in the mechanical world. Uh, because those are uh, 100 and 200 micrometers. Usually you are done at 20, 30, 50 micrometers. So it's 0 0.00 or 0 0.00. So you, you get a lot of zeros there and when you're putting it up. But it, it's really small. But <coughs> you really don't have to have a lot of uh, clearance between, between the cylindrical part and the hole in order to get it inside. It, uh, you are only talking about micrometers there in order to get it. But that again is when you're doing subsea stuff. What if you get corrosion or or uh, uh, marine growth or something inside the hole or on the on the cylinder? That's going to be a huge problem because then you have you almost have no space to go. So so that's that's where you have to uh, to really think about where you're putting the stuff. So function wise, a really tight tolerance might be very good, but wherever you're placing it might mean that this is not a good tolerance. Anyway, you should have a, a larger tolerance for it. <coughs> uh, there are other ways of dimensioning also. Um, uh, th this one is basically the same one as here, uh, only that instead of showing everyone on a separate line like this, uh, they've managed to use it as a, they have a zero point here. So it's zero to 50. 0 to 115, 0 to 220. So they can still put them on the same line, but everything is being measured from the same point, same starting point. The only problem with these is that they can become a bit messy. If there's a lot of dimensions, they can be a bit difficult to read uh, on the drawing. So, so if, you, uh, if you don't have room for this, try this. And if that becomes very difficult to read, uh, you will have to try to either expand it to several sheets or, or something like that. <coughs> and these are just examples to show that you don't necessarily need to have the, the zero point as the corner there. You can also put the zero point as the center of a hole or something and work your way from there. <coughs> um, you can also do it as coordinates. I've never seen that. N n neither as uh, as a mechanic or as uh, as a mechanical engineer, I've never seen anybody use this. But 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 it, but it is supposed to be used uh, in the industry every now and then. 
So uh, I, I think it is a bit more more usual if you are uh, if you are uh, in a workshop and you're using like a laser cutter or something to to cut out plates, then it's a bit more usual to see this kind of stuff. But but usually the drawing that comes from the engineer will will look more like this, and then it's the workshop personnel that creates this one instead that, uh, that they would use on their on their equipment. Because then it's, uh, it's much easier for the laser to have, have uh, coordinates that it move to this coordinate, make a cut like this, and move to another coordinate, make a cut like this. Uh, that's a bit easier to program into a, into a cutter. Uh, it is also possible to, to create patterns of dimensions. Like here we have, uh, have a plate with a lot of holes in them. So it's 340 millimeters long, and they've cut it to show that it's, uh, it's not necessary to show the entire length. And they have holes, even though they have cut it there, it's supposed to be holes uh, all the way along it. But all they've done is to show that we have 10 uh, to the first hole there, and then we have 16 between the holes, and we are going to have 20 times those holes. So 20 times the, uh, the length of 16 between each hole. Uh, so th that's a way of sort of compressing uh, things and saving space on the sheet. Uh, the same has been done here. They have on just cut away uh, some of the slots, so they've dimensioned the slot itself and the length to the next slot, and then they've said that eight times we're going to have eight of these slots along the entire length. There. Uh, the same can be done with angles. Just say six times sixty on this one, and five times forty on that one. So it's, uh, it, it is possible to save space by doing this if you have patterns that are repeating themselves. So we have uh, <coughs> several ways of showing diameters and radius, or radii, as is the plural for it. You can. Show it as uh, as an arrow just pointing to the inside of the arc. You can show it uh, if you only have an arc. Uh, if you have closer to a full full circle, you can show an arrow for to, to both edges or to the outsides of both edges. Whatever you have room for in your uh, in your drawing and whatever is going to to make the most sense when you are are reading. So often. Often things depend on uh, you being able to, when you're creating a drawing, to sort of just take a step back and try to start viewing your drawing and reading it instead of just creating it. So you don't have to, have to try to place yourself in another person's shoes in order to see how would they read this drawing. Will they understand what I mean when I put this down there? <coughs> Uh, same with radiuses, uh, they are uh, usually either shown from a center point and to the red eye, or from the outside if it's an outside radius. You can do them on the inside also. Uh, you can also split them to show several, uh, just to, just to uh, show that uh, both of these are four millimeters. Another way of doing them is uh, writing uh, tip line. So you so you have uh, a diameter of 80, and then you put in tip behind it. The tip means typical, so it means that all other diameters that have not been given a specific dimension, they will also be 80. But that's another way of sort of avoiding to setting too many dimensions into your drawing. Uh, if you have spheres, that you're going to, to dimension, you will use the same, the, the, the phi and the r, but you will put a capital S in front. Okay. Just so, so that it's, it's as a sphere with a diameter of 30, or a sphere with a radius of 30. And I'm not quite sure why the book has done this, but it's used used small r there and capital R there, but, but it's supposed to be a capital R. When you're giving a radius, it's supposed to be a capital R. So I'm not quite sure why they have uh, have done this in, in this exact uh, illustration. Then, 
I think I'm going to send you along to Tulkan for the last two hours of this very long day that we're having. Uh, usually on Thursdays, these past two hours would have been in the CAD study with just the student's assistant. So you would, it would have been a different pace. You would be working in your own pace. So it wouldn't be as hard as, as uh, today has been. But every now and then, we will be doing these four-hour CAD uh, stuff, and it's going to be pretty hard, I would say. We're going to try to keep it. Uh, it will be a bit easier, because from, next, uh, from two weeks on, when we have CAD lectures, we will be doing them with only half of you each time. And uh, we will also be doing practice tasks in the mentor. We won't be doing heavy theory like this. Because it's today and tomorrow is heavy theory, and then afterwards we're going to just play around in the mentor and have fun. Thank you.